I uh, want to thank my panelists for joining me up here today and, and you guys for being here on the last afternoon of what's been a great week to the organizers as well. Thank you guys. Um, just want to start the panel with, with a quick anecdote uh, about why we're calling this Nobody Needs Another Mobile Game. So uh, I, uh, I grew up with 8-bit Nintendo. I got one for my sixth birthday. It was kind of what turned me on to video games, never turned back, played games every single day of my life since then. But when I was growing up, my brother and I uh, used to go to the video rental store. In America, we had Blockbuster Video. I think it was actually even before Blockbuster Video that we started doing this. And my parents would take us there pretty much every weekend, and uh, we would rent a video game. We would pay about $5 to rent a video game. And there were like, you know, six or eight racks of games. It seemed like just tons of games, hundred, you know, like 80 games. There's like 80 games on the rack. And we would stand there for what felt like hours, probably a little bit shorter, but we would stand there debating over which game we wanted to play. You know, the artwork, oh, my friend at school said this one was really cool, the guy behind the counter saying, did you check out this new game? And we would make that choice and, you know, plunk down my parents' hard-earned $4.95 and take the game home, and that was the game you had. That was your game. That was the game for the weekend. Well, fast forward 25, 30 years, and every week there's 20 free games in the App Store being featured, let alone the hundreds of others vying for those spots. There's dozens and dozens of games that you're hearing about on TV, you're hearing about them on Twitter, you're seeing them on the mobile ads inside the other games you're playing, and the reality is nobody needs another one. You know, how are you going to pull someone from the games they love and bring them into your game? Uh, so that's what we're, gonna hear, we're here to talk about today. How do you get people to come to your game? How do you cut through that clutter? And how have you know, players, big and small, been able to achieve the results they've seen? Um, we're going to try to stay away from very traditional user acquisition and try to talk a little bit about that world and, and how it's dovetailing nicely with the world of marketing. Um, and despite the sort of depressive sounding uh, title that I've chosen, you know, we want this to be a positive conversation because I do think that, you know, you're, you're looking at a couple of individuals up here who've seen amazing results, um, some who are not, you know, super well-funded and, and super big companies um, and have, have achieved some really, really incredible things by being smart, by being creative, by, by looking where not everybody else in the market is looking. So those are the types of things we're, we're going to talk about. And just to open this up, I would love for all of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, one of the things that, that I think is really interesting about the market that we're in right now is how quickly everything is changing. And when I think back to the stuff that we were doing three years ago at Scopely, some of the marketing tactics we were employing, some of the operational production tactics we were employing, it's just such a different world three years later. So I'd love for each of the panelists to introduce themselves and uh, perhaps give me a little anecdote of what is something that you guys were doing three or four years ago in the world of user acquisition and marketing that you would never do today in 2016? Yeah, so I'm uh, Daniel Hasselberg, co-founder and CEO of Mag Interactive. We're a Swedish mobile, mobile game studio. Uh, our biggest titles are Russell and WordBrain, combined roughly 90 million downloads. Um, what we did three years ago was basically, I think, driven by not having very much money because we we're a bootstrapped company. And also, I think there was, you didn't have the infrastructure you have today when it comes to user attribution and so on. So what I wouldn't do today is, is do these kind of app turbo-like campaigns, just push the game up with cheap, worthless installs, and then see what happens. So I think the, the big lesson that everyone's learned since then is that the quality of the traffic matters much more than the cost per install. But that's our approach three years ago was, what's the cheapest install we can find? That's a good install. Hello, everybody. My name is David. I uh, run the European office for Gameville, based out of Berlin. Gameville is a Korean mobile games publisher. Uh, we publish under the names of Come To Us and Gameville. Have games like Summoner's War, Dragon Blaze, Major League Baseball. Um, and about three years ago, I used to actually work at a user acquisition company. And so in 2013, UA was kind of like the Wild West, especially for mobile. It was really a gold rush time for agencies. We were doing very well, um, thanks to big budgets of people like King and Supercell and many, many others. But if you were actually working on the UA side, it was kind of dirty, because 
we were doing a lot of trading back and forth, and maybe not everything was like as high quality as it could have been or should have been. So now, um, thinking about what I wouldn't do anymore, I think I probably wouldn't want to work anyway anymore. Hi, I'm Saikala. I work for Space Ape Games. It's a um, high quality strategy game developer. Right now, we have uh, Summer Siege and Rival Kingdoms on both platforms, developing Unity. And uh, we have Transformers game in uh, soft launch. It's coming soon, this spring. Um, so three years ago, I was a bit more than three years ago, probably. I landed an internship in social casino gaming, a startup, then moved to mobile gaming and <coughs> In a clip as well. So three years ago was something in between, and the things that I wouldn't do that we did then made an assumption on organic uplift, K factor, and they say every install we buy, we're going to get another one for free organically. So right now, with all the fancy tools, um, attribution tools, and analytics, we can actually accurately enough measure it and predict scenario A, B, and C, and be more prepared. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Igor Pashenko. I'm a client partner in the gaming marketing team at Facebook. Uh, I manage uh, gaming partnerships and help web and mobile developers grow their games with Facebook. Looking back at three years ago, I wouldn't uh, say about myself. I would actually focus more on the trend that was, that was happening and what was done a lot and I wouldn't recommend I wouldn't do these days is uh, using, I'd say, deceptive ads and all possible ways to get users. So speaking back to, uh, to the guys that they mentioned, there were lots of examples like using, let's say, for example, kittens to draw installs, uh, nice pictures, or find differences or anything. So kind of driving low quality and working with very, very bad creative. These days, creative is extremely important, and it's paid much more attention to. So this is the biggest change I would see. Yeah, some great answers, guys. And I think there's, there's definitely some trends there that we can touch on in terms of the, the quality of users and uh, you know, real attribution and, and metrics coming into play. I guess just to kind of start generally, um, and you know, Daniel, maybe for you to, to kind of open things up, you know, as you've matured as a company and, and started running different types of campaigns, um, traditional UA campaigns, different types of marketing campaigns, do you have one unified goal across all these campaigns? Uh, is it just to get you know, a certain type of user in the game, or are there different types of goals that, that you aim for with different types of campaigns? Yeah, as I say, the, the majority of our budget is spent on, like, we have pretty fixed ROI goals, so we want to see X, X percent of the spend back in seven days and 30 days and so on. Uh, but we also do experimentation, look at different segments of users. So. If you can see, for, for example, uh, we do casual games, and the typical spender in our games are women that are 35, 40, and up age-wise. But maybe the most kind of viral or, or the ambassadors of the games are younger, so it could still make sense to buy traffic with lower LTV, but will help drive growth in general. Um, and then we also have, we spend a lot of time and money on retargeting. So even if you have really great retention in a game, if it's been alive for two, three, four years, still the majority of everyone who's played your game is not playing it anymore. But you have a lot of information on who are the best players that are not playing anymore. You can retarget them. And that's where we spend a lot of money and have super high returns. I truly recommend that to understand the data of the player who, who left you and try to get the best of those guys back. It's, it's a very efficient way of doing marketing, I think. Yes, yeah, Saikala, I'd be curious to hear your opinion as well, given you know, your, your expertise across multiple genres, casual, casino, and, and now mid-core, um, and also you know, representing the other kind of mid-sized publisher developer on the panel. Yeah, well, um, currently in strategy games, we have to be a lot more targeted and uh, segment our audience. We, we do have different goals for different channels and different types of marketing. So straightforward use new user acquisition, you buy users, you bring you know, user base up your daily actives and monthly actives. But also there is another thing that um, retention. Retention is when you keep communicating with your existing users, you know they're active, you know what they're doing. 
but you need to keep in touch. Let them know the new features are coming up, uh, the game event is coming up, and it's more about keeping the conversation going. So part of that would be the community's work, but also part of that would be a small marketing budget as well on the ads, because people are so busy these days. They're always on mobile, they're always there, there and there, so you kind of need to have different touch points. And as well as uh, you guys, we do uh, re-engagement on a smaller scale a little bit. Um, that's pretty much it right now, but in the past, in social casino, but also in mobile casual games, we did a lot of re-engagement and uh, yeah, all of that. So speaking of scale, which you, which you touched on, um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the things that we've seen at Scopely and, and uh, I think a lot of other companies have felt is that the types of campaigns, the types of marketing approaches that you take uh, varies, um, not just on, on the goal of the campaign, but on the scale of that campaign and, and how you're running it. Um, I mean, Igor, you have a, a pretty global view of, of the world of marketing. I'd be curious to hear if you're, if you're seeing different kinds of tactics being employed at, at different scale, what, what you're seeing working best and, and kind of what those, those right approaches lead to. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, speaking of scale and well, work of uh, smaller developers or maybe larger developers but just rolling out their new game uh, or soft launching it, uh, you would, for example, if you're less experienced, you would work on your own sometimes uh, if it's a smaller, uh, smaller partner. There would you know you know have have one person running their uh, their campaigns, be it Facebook or elsewhere, and uh, it would be just low touch, say one country, two countries, just to do the tests. When you when you're scaling, when you're growing, when you're uh, going to different countries, you will uh, most likely involve an agency or several. You will work with uh, one of the uh, marketing partners uh, to do the technical to apply the technical solution that they have. And of course, if you're more sophisticated, more advanced, and you're scaling globally and rolling out the game uh, across the world, then you would uh, most likely use automation. So you would uh, have a separate, uh, separate user acquisition team that works very tightly with the creative team, and then you build your technical solution to make sure that you streamline and scale your game promotion across. Yeah, speaking of, of global scale, um, we're fortunate to have one of the, the biggest global players uh, represented on the, on the panel in, uh, in Gameville. So David, um, you know, I'm curious from your perspective, I mean, you guys are running campaigns in various regions of the world. I imagine, you know, different creatives all over the place, different types of campaigns. I mean, how are you guys managing this? What, is, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis when you think about the East versus the West, the games that are top grossing games versus some of your smaller titles? I mean, what, what, how do you guys handle that? It's actually quite challenging. Um, scaling our UA and our marketing on a global level is uh, not that easy because we are in, in some ways maybe cursed by the success in Korea. So our HQ, both for Gameville and Come To Us, is in Korea. We're seeing a lot of success for both companies there. Um, but things that work in Korea don't necessarily translate to other regions. So um, right now we're doing a lot of experimenting or you know, building on the success of Summoner's War, which is, uh, allows us to just do more and more marketing in more countries in different channels. So of course we follow all the you know, ROI-based uh, Facebook and other networks and agency partners, but we're also extending uh, our marketing because the game is becoming so big now to the more traditional avenues. So we're doing billboards around Anime Expo in uh, Los Angeles. We did billboards around Gamescom in Germany. We're doing TV in the US. We're doing TV in Germany, France, UK. All of these things just to you know, get the game out there and really make it more of a branding play almost because we have now reached that level with this title. For other games, uh, it's harder. A game like Dragon Blaze, from Gameville, is top 10 grossing in Korea for a long time, uh, published through Kakao in Korea, so very different uh, than doing it in the West where there is no Kakao. For the people that are not aware, Kakao is a messaging app in Korea. It's like ubiquitous, everybody has it, and it, has a, uh, it promotes games for you, it takes a cut out of it. Um, so we also have to you know, pay them back. Uh, in the West, that doesn't exist, so um, the game also looks very Korean, it makes substantially less revenue in the West, it's more of a top 100 title, so the, the marketing approach there is much more, you know, smaller scale, really ROI focused, trying to find those users that work well, then re-engaging with them, and building that up is the challenge that we are facing right now. 
Cool. All right, so let's, let's start getting a little bit more specific. So up here we've got a couple different genres represented. Um, I guess Facebook is all things to all people. Uh, but, but we've got casual, we've got core, we've got stra in, within core, we've got a company that I think is probably best known for RPG, a company that's best known for, for strategy, RTS specifically. Is it easier to market a casual game than a, than a core game? What, what are the challenges that, are, that, that you guys face that, that you see as specific to your particular genres? From the experience of uh, working with casual games and now with strategy games, um, I speak for myself, but I think casual games are easier. Uh, a lot easier for me anyway. Um, the, the challenges with strategy games right now is uh, click to install conversion ratio. That brings the, the cost really high and the, 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 the user base or the target audience is not as big as casual. When you have a casual, um, you have uh, a lot more millions and millions of users who potentially can like your game. So hence why you have the scale and you can pay less for an install and you can maybe make a better profit margin. For us, we have to be really, really targeted. We have to use our analytics every day. We need to make sure we're very accurate and structured to get those users that we need. And the market is also quite saturated these days, especially with Supercell taking over the world of strategy. You know, it's, it's hard for everyone, I think. But uh, the important thing that the niche is still there, and it's good. So Daniel, it sounds like you got a pretty easy job. It's easy, yeah. to mark, easy to mark casual games. Yeah. Super easy. No, I, I think the challenge is, it's also depending on category. So we have, we have both games in the word category where we are actually having fairly easy time growing the games, but we also have a match three game where we have the similar situation, but with King and, uh, and some other players really dominating the categories, making it expensive and, and really tough. So I think it's, it's within the segments, it's also where, what kind of category of game you have. But it, the upside of casual is, of course, you, it's easier to get a high organic uplift as well, because if you tell 10 friends that you like this game, maybe seven, eight will actually care to try. Whereas if you have a core game, maybe none of your friends are interested. So we see a very, very big percentage of all players uh, being organic. So when, yeah, when we buy more traffic, we also see the organics growing quickly together with the acquired traffic. Yeah, and I agree with the casual games. The, um, the user base are very social, so they don't mind sharing with their friends, inviting, and so on. With casual games, they're probably a little bit more, not secretive, but conservative about what they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we see both with uh, Facebook and Instagram, for example, that we can get a lot of engagement even in the ads. So we get a lot of likes and comments on the ads themselves, which that's right. amazing to me. But that helps you a lot with kind of being more relevant in the Facebook algorithms, I guess, Igor. I don't know if you know <laughs> how the machine works, but it seems, seems to be really good for your kind of click-through rates and CPMs. So the, the more people engage, the more they trust that ad, the more Facebook will surface that ad, and it's kind of a virtuous cycle. Yes. So I, th I think that's a good advice to anyone. If you have a game where you can actually make the ad engaging so you can ask the person who sees the ad if they can help solve this problem or engage with the content of the ad, everything will go much easier. Yes, I agree. And uh, regarding the opportunities, because we talked about challenges, but opportunities, I think, just because it is so much harder for strategy games to, you know, with all this click to install conversion ratio being low, costs are expensive, and we have to work so much harder is actually not a bad thing because it pushes us into the stage where we need to explore other creative options. We go and figure out other ways to buy traffic and how else can we target. We leverage uh, community tools, uh, YouTube gaming apps, and doing stuff there as well. And there are some other things that you can do with the preloads and partnering with Verizon and things like that. And there are some targeting options there, too. So I think uh, that makes us better marketeers because of that. And you have much higher LTVs. So you have, a, have an oh, yeah. upside on the other side. So. Well, it comes with the cost. <laughs> I just want to add uh, from, uh, from my side, if we zoom out from the genre, 
and look at overall the opportunity how to get your game out there. If you use Facebook, it's 1.5 1 billion people across the globe, and with Instagram, it's 400 million. So the, uh, the space is quite large, and uh, there's lots of opportunities to get your game out there, to, to show your game. But don't forget that you're not competing against Supercells and the kings of the world. You're competing against Coca-Cola with their beautiful ads, uh, Procter & Gamble, and all those big, beautiful brands, and e-commerce as well, that, that have the same opportunity to be in the newsfeed of the people, of your potential players that are sitting there uh, on Facebook and on Instagram. So uh, back to your point regarding different ways, different more creative approaches, I fully agree. And what's been really killing it is the video, as you guys, I'm, I'm sure you know this, uh, with 8 billion view, video views per day on the platform, it's, it's the new most engaging, I would say, um, creative type that, that we have, and that's, that's evolving. And if you have really, really good videos, interesting of your gameplay, or maybe some story, especially if it's a nice story built around the game, uh, or, or about your players, uh, your potential audience, this will resonate with uh, your potential gamers uh, the best. So here, if you zoom out of the genres, the ch challenges for everybody is, are the same. Discoverability and retention, and just using more interesting approaches to get your people in the game. Cool, so a lot, a lot of good stuff here. So I'm hearing video, uh, alternative ways of, of marketing. Uh, it, it begs the question that I think you can't walk around a conference like this and not hear people talking about it. Influencer marketing. YouTube, it's also non-video, you know, you've got Instagram, Vine even, if that's video, I don't know. Uh, does it work? I mean, how, what are the results you guys are seeing with, with influencer marketing? Yes, it does. Um, we, we have a separate team who runs anything to do with in influencers. And influencers on YouTube specifically, there are even Facebook influencers, by the way. Um, so there, there, there is a community there, and um, it, is, it does work. It's just uh, traditional UA people should like take their hats off and imagine this different world and it's not measured in the same way. You don't use your attribution partner for these things. Certain things just can't be measured and then certain things you would just need to measure your baseline and then go during the campaign and a uh, little bit straight after the campaign. You measure the appropriate time when when you run this influencers campaign, either on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever else you do with the community and the influencers, and make sure that you have the baseline. Take that out, and then whatever is the uplift, that's going to be it. It's about measurement. But I think the, the problem with that is that you can then see what the CPI is, but you can't track those users and see what the LTV is. So it's, it's, I mean, it, it's a non-performance-based marketing in a way. Yeah. It's like TV, you can do time-based attribution, so you see we got 5,000 users, we paid yeah. $5,000, so okay, it's a decent CPI, but are they going to spend any money? And you will never know who those guys are. Well, you can not. do some sort of tracking. Yeah, so you can not, tag them. Yeah, you yeah. can tag them, you can use your traditional attribution uh, tracking links, so you can do that, but you also need to remember that our normal you know, daily routine, we don't always want to use those tracking links if they're not implemented in the easiest way. So some of the traffic would come through the attribution tracking links, but then some of it, a lot of it won't. So you kind of need to calculate it in a blended way think, and make I, your peace with it. I think <laughs> at least for casual games, I, I imagine you have a lot of people doing Let's Play videos and whatever. They, you can engage with that influencer 100 times and it's still relevant. For casual games, is more check this game out, and that makes it really hard to reuse a good influencer. So, like, it's it's really hard to scale for casual games. I think you need to have a lot of influencers that, that you can like go from group to group to group to group to, to build a volume that actually is meaningful. Yes. Since the game itself is not, I mean, it's not super fun to watch someone play a casual game. Yes, I totally agree, and I think it's not applicable, influencers marketing is not applicable to all genres. For us particularly, it works because the game strategy games are very involved. If you've ever played Summer Siege or Rebel Kingdoms, um, it, it's very involved. You spend time on building, fighting, 
um, joining alliance, creating alliance, you do so many things. So influencers become important because they're part of your alliance or they teach you how to play a game or they show you tips and tricks how to, I don't know, progress faster and things like that. So for strategy games, it is important. And that's one of the things that we found when we see like, oh my God, conversion rate is low, CPI is high, somehow we need to find other ways. So we went creatively and we found a group of few that work for us. And yeah, we just keep using that. I remember one example you mentioned, uh, the uh, Facebook influencers. I remember one example from Instagram influencers as well. Uh, where uh, you know a, a celebrity or a, you know a known person would post something that I'm I'm playing this game and it, you know I'm just totally killing. Uh, it was I think that example was in the slots genre, and uh, I've I've seen that across other other genres as well. So this you find your niche as you as you mentioned, and especially like on Instagram, so if you talk about a bit more on organic distribution, their hashtags, they, they, they work very well if you work them in a smart way, if you build out your entire strategy, paid and organic, because they usually, of course, they, they will go together and uh, use influencer marketing in the, only in those cases where you know that uh, partly you can measure and you know that uh, your game is, will be closely tied to the person that's spreading the love f about the game. So, so, sounds like there's something there. I, I, I mean, I would have to agree. We've, we've done it at Scopely and seen some really strong results, especially when, when combined with, with, you know, kind of a, a global approach to marketing. What do you guys find is, is the right way to engage influencers? You know, I mean, there's agencies out there. I, I'd actually, maybe as a tangential question, be curious to hear what, what people think about Chartboost acquire, acquiring Rooster the other day. Um, there's, you know, the kind of the one-off campaigns. There's the PewDiePie's of the world. Clearly not many of them. Uh, I mean, how, how do you manage this, and, and, and what's the best way to engage? From what I know, um, our community team does. Um, it's very manual. It's tedious. And uh, from my perspective, because we have all of the analytics and automation in the head, but uh, it's relationship management and make it work for them, but also make it work for us. And it's not all about money. It's about uh, having an engage, engaging, very good product, a game that is fun, a game that is interesting, and a game that influencers would be you know, enjoying promoting. So um, you first, you go and talk to them. I guess uh, an influencer, would, they would have a list of a few influencers. Then we go and talk to them and see if they're interested in promoting our game. And, you know, if they like the game, we'll continue talking and we'll see what can we work out commercially as well. So would you say it's actually better to go directly to the influencers and not go through the agencies and representations and all this kind of stuff? Well, there is a, there's a two things, right? There are lots of small influencers and there are PewDiePie's of the world. So of course you can't go directly. You would have to go through a team of people who look after that business. So that's how it's done usually. So you're doing both? Yes. And Daniel reminded us earlier that PewDiePie is Swedish, um, and, that is, and that is part of his charm. Okay, just making that clear. Um, so, so aside from influencer marketing, um, what kinds of offline uh, campaigns are you guys running? By offline, I mean sort of this, you know, not super trackable, you know, types of things. Um, are you guys running billboards, TV, uh, you know, other physical types of promotions. What kinds of things are you guys doing? So um, I'm not sure I said it before on this panel. I certainly said it before on the other panel I was on just now. Um, we do TV and billboards for Summoner's War, just driven by the success of the game. So it's big enough that it warrants us to do this kind of things. I feel like overall marketing for mobile games, or just generally marketing for online games by now, um, is moving towards a more classical direction. So we used to be very, very focused on just ROI, uh, really making sure after seven days this campaign is positive, whatever, all these kind of very trackable things. Um, and we're now starting to embrace the you know, classical marketing approach where, where you do build the brand and you try to build the trust in, in, for the game uh, with a global audience if you want to go mass market like we are trying to do with Summoner's War. So TV is definitely a big part of our marketing mix for that game right now. Uh, not so much for the other titles because they're still maybe too s not big enough in the West, but certainly for Summoner's War. Billboards too, around Gamescom. We did not have a booth at Gamescom, 
uh, we were thinking about it, but it is very expensive to put a presence at a show and fly all the people in and do something meaningful. And it's almost more effective to just spend that money on billboards around Gamescom is what we found, at least for last year. And that worked out pretty okay for us. Do you think billboards are more effective in particular countries? Sorry. Uh, hard to answer. Um, I know we're doing it a lot in Korea. In Korea, there's just out-of-home ads everywhere. Um, it made sense for us at Gamescom because we were also doing TV at the same time, and then it was the big gaming event, so we felt it just made sense to have a presence there. In, Los in the US, we did it a little bit earlier around Anime Expo in Los Angeles, where we actually had a booth, uh, but that was easier for us because we have our uh, US office in LA, and uh, Anime Expo made a lot of sense because the game you know, is very anime style. We could share the booth with Gameville together. Um, so that was relatively cost effective. And we did see uh, uplift around that in the game, just by giving out flyers at the show and all these kind of things without TV. Giving out flyers with codes? Yeah. Mm, good. Pretty cheap way of doing things, actually, from one of the biggest companies in the world. It's kind of cool. Uh, so, and I, I actually want to say, Gameville had uh, come to us, had my number one favorite placement of a mobile ad as a baseball fan, sitting in Dodger Stadium last summer, seeing a commercial on the big screen for Summer's War. I just thought that was really cool. Um, definitely creative. So, what I'm hearing from you guys is that you don't track this stuff. I mean, to a, to a large extent. Like, you know, should, we, should you track it? Do you, do you try to track it? Is, it? is it just thought of in kind of a, from a budgeting perspective? Is it just separate from the budget that you have that you're trying to kind of turn into an ROI positive uh, type of thing? I mean, what, what is the best approach to this or what are the challenges you guys are fighting through right now? Well, I, I think it would be stupid to just blow your budget and then be like, yeah, whatever. That makes no sense at all. Um, you can track TV to a certain de uh, degree. As uh, Daniel said, so you can you, you get you get the you can see when your TV spot was running, uh, who it was targeted to. You can in that time window kind of estimate okay how many people pro possibly came from that spot. So that gives you a calculated CPI. And of course, you wanna as you continue running TV, you want to bring this calculated CPI down, which is possible. Uh, we've been running TV in Germany for a few months now, and we managed to slash it by at least 50%. Um, and you should do that because otherwise you're just paying way too much and you're also just in the wrong channels. You usually work together with an agency that sorts out all the TV for you and the agency will always be conflicted, right? On the one hand, they want to give you a good service. On the other hand, they just want to make money. So they always say, yes, there's this big, you know, Saturday evening prime time thing and you should do it because it's going to be really good for your branding. But, you know, it's also going to be very expensive. So you, you kind of have to hold them accountable for what they're doing. Um, aside from that, I think, as Saikala said, to some degree, you also have to let go and just look at the big picture branding effect that you're hoping to achieve two, three months down the road. Um, and then, of course, you need to be able to do that financially. But if you can, then you should just look at your, you know, your chart position in that country and the revenues you're generating overall and see if the trend is going up. And if it's not, after three months, six months, then you probably just want to stop because it doesn't work. Have you seen that TV works better in certain markets? So we have done it in, I can only really speak for the European success, and that's three countries. So I'm not sure if that already qualifies. It certainly worked. So we have seen uplift in Germany and in France, uh, that I can say. So last year when we started, Summoners War was like a top 10, top 20 game. It's now top crossing number two in both countries on Android. Impressive. One thing to add about TV, as, um, as we are now in the age of multiple screens, uh, very often you would uh, catch yourself you know, looking at your uh, mobile phone or your tablet while watching TV. So this is, if you, if you do use requisition, uh, you do the direct response part of it, and you, you do branding. I see more and more companies focus on branding apart from doing the TV campaigns or uh, possibly billboards. Uh, f some companies would run um, campaigns on Facebook doing uh, reaching frequency, just pretty much like TV buy. You set your, what, uh, what uh, the reach of the audience you want to find and how often you want to show them the ad, and it would be mostly focused uh, around you know, specific events, especially if it's a big uh, sports games or you know some big shows, 
uh, this uh, this is also you can measure this especially if it's run through Facebook or Instagram but this is usually complementary because it's uh, multiple screens and uh, you can emphasize and reinforce the effect of uh, your brand branding campaign which uh, moves into direct response campaign later on that's also kind of a sorry kind of a no-brainer of course when you run TV you will also run your other performance ads just you know synced up with that so of course you'll be on Facebook during the TV ad break when you expect the ad to be shown and then you can see uplift there and you know better conversion rates so your performance based marketing might actually become a little cheaper while you're paying a lot for the TV yeah and, and uh, one more point actually uh, on running if you, uh, if you do well you do this uh, you show more branding campaign, especially if it's video. One option you can do is collect the audience, the people that have seen your video, and then retarget back to your point on re-engagement, retarget them, and the probability that they will download your game is much higher if they hadn't seen than if they hadn't seen the, uh, the ad before. So this is kind of a nice mix of a branding campaign that uh, strengthens the results of a direct response campaign later on. Um, I actually have tried the origin frequency First time we tried it, um, we did not take our UA hats off, and we're like, oh my god, this is not working. But then we tried it again and again, and we made it work. It's, uh, it's, it's about measurement, it's about thinking, this is not direct response, this is something else complementary. And uh, yeah, then we discovered that we should book it way in advance, because then more cost effective and things. But yeah, it's pretty good, and uh, videos are great just um, optimize towards video views and then retarget them with normal direct response ads. That's it. And yeah. it's actually cheaper that way. Yeah. yeah. Cool, so I think we're, uh, we're coming towards the end. I wanna leave a little bit of time for some audience Q&A. Um, one topic that, that's another you know, much buzzed about topic that I think is worth touching on at the very least, especially in lieu of an announcement that uh, Space Ape recently made uh, around their Transformers title with, with uh, Backflip is Licensed IP and how it affects, you know, getting the word out about your game. I mean, obviously, it comes with a cost most often. Um, it's, it comes with uh, an operational expense of working with a licensor. But, um, you know, what are you guys seeing with, uh, with licenses that you may have worked with in the past? Um, Igor, with, with, you know, licensed properties versus original IP on your platform. I'd be curious to hear, uh, Saikala, how you guys think about that when making the decision to, to step into, uh, into that world. Well, um, like our founder said, Hasbro came to us and said, you are a high quality strategy game developer. We would like our Transformers to have a great game. So our founders thought for three seconds and said, yep, let's do it. <laughs> of course, who would say no? Um, how we, 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 see, we see the numbers, the brand definitely helps. The brand helps and we build a product together both Hasbro, Backflip, and uh, Space Ape are involved from the start, from the prototype and then to the game design, game development. Right now, we're working on marketing plans, fine-tuning things and testing, it, all the way from the start. So you have to have a good relationship. You have to keep, it's like, it's like a marriage. You need to, I mean, not literally, but you need to keep communication channels open. You need to, we have a common goal. We want to have uh, the great game that everybody would love, that would add value to the Transformers brand as well, but also gives us a benefit that our CPI costs go like half, engagement level goes higher, and then all the metrics go through the roof. That's great. I Igor, what are you seeing on, on, on the Facebook platform? I mean, are you seeing, is it dramatic, the, the click-through rates that you're seeing between licensed IP and, and non-licensed, are, are the CPIs? very different, like what effects does it have? Speaking of the uh, Facebook platform itself, there are not that many celebrity games, but since uh, Facebook is a mobile company, we help partners. Uh, prim primarily, we would see most uh, ad spend uh, from uh, mobile, uh, mobile games. And if you look at uh, you know, Kim Kardashian game, the, the, more, uh, the, uh, the earlier story and mo more recent one, the Arnold Schwarzenegger game uh, with the mobile strike, the peep, the, um, the effect of the celebrity uh, definitely works. And it, um, you know, people associate the game not with the gaming studio, but with the celebrity that promotes, especially in, in the most recent case of uh, where this you know, powerful star, ex-governor, uh, 
is kind of number one uh, featured in the game. So there, uh, it, you, should, you cannot just measure direct response and compare the CPIs of a similar game to the celebrity game. This will not be the way, the way to measure it, because you'll get so much organic distribution uh, and so much buzz. Uh, and free press around the game. So uh, in, in the long run, uh, I would say uh, the companies, they, they should be, uh, I believe they would be smart enough to calculate whether it makes sense for them to sign uh, a new star uh, or not to, to build an IP or celebrity game. And uh, we see more and more of this trend uh, in the past year and uh, in 2016 so far. It's, uh, it's been visible with the Transformers launch and uh, I'm sure there will be more in the pipeline. So it's. As you mentioned, it's much more. There is much more engagement, and um, I would say they'll be able to to kind of build a, a bigger story and to move the, the movies that people will never forget into the gaming world and make it, I would say, much more fun. I think there is one thing good to mention, though, because uh, it's great to have uh, access to this big IP that has been around for years and years, and have uh, you know add to the brand as well, but. At the same time, you kind of need to think of your target audience. How old are they now? How old were they then when they first saw Transformers? When did you become uh, a fan of Schwarzenegger? Uh, when did you like his page? And things like that. Because we've gone through this stage where at the beginning we thought, ah, yeah, we were great. We um, developed these beautiful games with 3D graphics and music and all that fancy stuff. And Rival Kingdoms is a beautiful game, but it's a little bit core, and hence why the audience becomes smaller, the target audience. So at the beginning, when you know we took on Transformers project, we thought, yep, yeah, that's a piece of cake, we can do it. It's just different art. But it's not. Then we looked, about, looked at business objectives, and we thought, OK, there's so many Transformers fans out there, and we want to reach as many as we can. This means we need to change the game. We need to change the engine. We need to make it more engaging and more relevant to Transformers fans and also bring a bit of nostalgia in the game and build a story around it. So it's not just another strategy game. It's about Transformers. And that's important because that would also affect your metrics when you start buying traffic. Really, really good points. And, uh Igor, I love the way you described uh, Mobile Strike. It's not the machine zone game or, uh, or Mobile Strike or that strategy game that's very difficult to play. It's the Arnold Schwarzenegger game. It's pretty telling right there. So thank you guys again. Thank you to the panelists. I, I would love to open it up um, for some questions from the audience. Feel free to, uh, to fire away. Hello. Thank you very much for mentioning the acquisition of Rooster. This is Rooster and Chart Boost right here. So we're thrilled <laughs> to hear so much about influencer marketing during Casual Connect in Amsterdam. And the question that we have is mainly for game developers. When you're doing your influencer campaigns in-house, which so many successful game developers do, do you run into issue of scale? Do, they, do, do you run into issues? Issues of scaling. You know, issues of scaling. Well, it depends how uh, big is the influencer, of course. Um, I think the scaling, yes, there will be an issue if you use just one or two, but we use many. So that's, you need to look at the big picture. So if you need um, an uplift by, I don't know, you predict that you need to get at least 10,000 new installs from that kind of area per day or per week or whatever, that would be a mix of different influencers. Unless you work directly with uh, representatives of PewDiePie or any of uh, really big ones, then of course um, there won't be any issue with scaling. I know you've mentioned that sometimes you just don't track certain things because you know with influencer you don't always want to give them a link and so you can estimate the CPI but you're not necessarily certain about lifetime value of the user that's coming from a certain influencer. Is that something that you're looking to change in the future so you're more educated about how each channel is doing as compared to another channel? It's hard to say right now because uh, it is not measured in traditional direct response way. So most of the times, let's say if we need a benchmark to predict how effective or I don't know what the user is going to do, we kind of compare them with organics. So whatever we can't attribute would be more or less similar. We'll just keep that as a benchmark in mind. 
Um, in the future, I don't know, because that depends on technology where it moves. So I, I think we, we should be able to. I mean, we, should, we can measure the hell out of the TV, mm -hmm. so I'm sure there will be something that come up in technology going forward that you know, can show us very accurate numbers. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question for, uh, for the, uh, the bigger developers on the panel. And um, are, are you guys talked about a lot of different, uh, different forms of marketing and, and paid acquisition, whether it be online or offline. How much are, are big game developers focused on, on really uh, figuring out the organic approach and like app store optimization? Is that a discussion that's, that's happening internally? Or are you really relying on the, uh, the organics to increase based on your paid acquisition? I'm not sure if I understood the question. Can you please repeat? So, so you talked about a, a number of different, you guys have budgets depending, you're, you're splitting up your budgets for different paid acquisitions. Um, is there any budgeting talk happening about putting money into app store optimization, which is really trying to grow organically? So optimization after? Yeah, like, we're, you know, like the, there's... Oh, app store optimization. Yes. Ah, sorry, no, I got it. Um, of course, we try to have good app store pages um, with decent localization for the different languages. Um, we don't particularly use any, let's say, ASO agency or anything like that to go over what we're doing. We are in very close touch, uh, contact with Apple and Google to just make sure that we comply and that they like what we are building. And for the you know, more impressive titles like Afterpulse, for example, which is a, you know, almost console quality shooter, we get the special pages from Apple as well. So I think that's more our approach. I can add to that, uh, if I may, yeah. Um, we uh, believe that app store optimization adds value to a lot of value to click to install conversion ratio and hence why we work really closely with product testing things. So right now Transformers is in soft launch in Australia and New Zealand. We are testing a lot and uh, we use a tool called Store Maven. You've probably heard of it. Uh, you can A-B test icons, screenshots, videos, you can description anything you want for both uh, Google, uh, Google Play and uh, iTunes as well. Um, yeah, we basically test, A-B test the hell about, out of everything, so whatever goes live has to be the best that it can be at that moment. And then refreshing it time to time with new content. And as you mentioned, uh, it is important to have store pages localized in the languages that the game is localized. And we have a, a guy working full time with ASO, working closely with the guys who buy traffic for the games. And we actually, we did use Store Maven before, but now we use just the Google Play built-in functionality. So we do all the testing on the Google Play side. Run, we always run a bunch of different experiments at all times and optimize screenshots, text, icons. And then we apply it to both platforms when we see the changes, and then it's amazing how big changes you can get by optimizing the stuff you have there. You can get the beauty install rate up to 50% better than you have with an unoptimized page, which will save you tons of money if you spend at the level we're spending on, on user acquisition. I think Google Play is great, but uh, iOS store is, looks different, and hence why the the impact would be different because in Google Play Store you have uh, different visual screenshots down below and things. This is why probably for casual games it's slightly different. You can apply that kind of structure to both. But in strategy games we have to use Store Maven for iOS and for Android we use Google Experiments that are free. It's excellent but it, it's really different for us. Uh, we, we see the first screenshot makes a ton of difference and then you get further down is not as important anymore. When yeah. So I think you get 80% at least right by just applying Google stuff to iTunes and then maybe there's some nuances to what you can do. Hi, thanks for doing the talk by the way. It's uh, very interesting. Um, just to take it on a very different kind of uh, perspective, all this 
using of you know putting money into user acquisition you know these these trends and uh, tactics on trying to get people to play a product it hasn't been around for that long in these kind of studies you know like uh, going to these events you learn a lot more about it and it's very trending but what what at some point that doesn't work anymore have you thought of that about like how much you can build on these researches and, and, and findings that has been researched thus far, and what does it do to you? Maybe it's a bit, a bit complicated okay. question. That would be a very tough situation, of course. <laughs> I, I think it's going in the other direction, actually. So the more, if you compare the tools you have right now to three years ago, yeah. it's being much more sophisticated, and you can automate much more, so soon you don't even have to have an agency if you have one because just the API support and all the kind of automatic functionality you can just tell the machine what you're after and then it's a matter of making a game that's really great people want to spend time in that game and you get the money back but I mean of course if I don't know brands would come in and just completely destroy CPM levels on Facebook I think we would all be in trouble uh, but we're improving faster than the competition you need to do that otherwise you're always going to be in trouble, I think, in a fast-moving industry. I think maybe what you're alluding to is kind of buying your way to success and just, you know, spending your way to the top of the charts and then making a lot of money with your game. I think that's over already. Um, you can't just go in now, spend lots of money on your way, and then you get rich. The game has to be good. If, if the game isn't really good and fun, then all the marketing is not going to save you in the end. Um, Maybe a few years ago when you know, people just were starting to discover Facebook as a UA opportunity with games on Facebook, maybe to a certain extent, and for some companies, this was true then, but it's not the case anymore. However, that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do UA and marketing in a professional way, because of course we have to do all we can to buy ourselves as much to the top as possible, but then the game has to deliver, and that's the case for any game on any platform. It's the same for GTA or Halo or you know, our mobile games. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think you need to kind of think about it as a marketing and UA department in the company where you develop these engaging, great games for the users. Marketing is a service, service for the great game. So you have this amazing product that's very sticky, very engaging, players love it and play it every day you need to have a promotion team that would go and market it for you so you can bring users faster. I would look at it as a service. Don't forget one thing, that your marketing is your game. So given that you have a great game and people would be willing to play it, then how you market it is extremely important. And what I referred to at the beginning of, of this panel, where people use deceptive approaches to promote games, this does not work anymore. Facebook and Instagram, I'm sure uh, many other uh, partners would, be, would penalize uh, game developers and publishers for using deceptive techniques or just taking your creative or your audience for granted. If you, uh, if you use wrong targeting, if you use creative and you don't refresh it, it's the same picture or the same uh, badly produced video over and over again, then, uh, as you refer, it will not work anymore, and the game will be just sitting there alone in the App Store among three million other apps uh, out there. So creative is extremely important these days, and if you stay creative in marketing your games, you will, you will always win. And if you m layer measurement on top and automation, which is a big part of the future, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you know, you'll reach big successes for your game. So that's, that's some pretty good stuff right there to, to end the panel. I mean, first of all, we've got more tools than we did three years ago. The people who are buying their way to the top, that's done. What did you say? You said something great, too. Make great games, and creativity always wins. I mean, that's, that's some pretty good, inspiring stuff. So nobody may need another mobile game, but if you do those things, you know, people might just play yours. And I want to thank you guys once again. Uh, really appreciate it. This was fantastic. I learned a lot listening to you guys speak. I hope it was helpful for everyone out there. And thank you again to Casual Connect for allowing us to do this.